next speaker is a paranormal investigator and historical document consultant. He is the author of Detecting Forgery, Forensic Investigation of Documents, and he's also a senior research fellow for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. So please welcome Joe Nichols to the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. It's great to be here again, and uh, thank you for having me back. This is a great venue. And uh, I'm happy to talk about all those trivial little topics that we've heard so much about. Um, yes, I will mention Bigfoot. Uh, but I, uh, just, just to follow up on, because DJ and I are on basically the same page, I hope we're all on basically the same page. Let me just say a little bit about where I'm coming from. I'm a former detective and, and a former magician, and I believe that things could be investigated. And so I've devoted my life to trying to investigate paranormal claims. The God question, I'm an atheist, and I, I'm an atheist because there's no good evidence for God. I have sort of the same position on God that I have on, on leprechauns. And so I believe that we should investigate anything where there's evidence, and we should let the evidence, we should not get ahead of the evidence. So I've investigated more religious things than pretty much anybody I know. Shroud of Turin, weeping statues, I've shaken the bloody hands of stigmatists. Uh, no one can say I haven't been out on the religion front as much or more than anyone. But I'm looking at evidence that can be tested, not the philosophy of, of atheism. So I. I have sort of the same view towards God that I have towards extraterrestrials. I, do, I just don't know what's there, but I tend to treat those things that I have no evidence for as if they don't exist. Sort of I was saying this morning, there might be a rock out there. I don't know that it doesn't have a fabulous gold treasure under it, but I treat it as if it doesn't. I wouldn't say I could prove that it doesn't, without going and digging up the rock. So I, I hope that makes some sense. I'm urging us all, no, no topic is off limits, but let us not be debunkers. I do not use that term. I do not allow myself to be called a debunker without uh, clarifying what's meant. If you mean, yes, I've, I've debunked uh, things as a consequence of my work, yes, I'm a notorious debunker. But the term suggests that I've started knowing, knowing the answer, and we should not do that. We don't know the answer to something until we've looked into it. True, there may be no ghosts. I think there are no ghosts, but I'm concerned with what is that phenomenon that's causing people to think there are ghosts. So I, I'm confident that if I can investigate and explain that, any needed debunking will take care of itself. Does that make sense? So I just try not to get ahead of the evidence. I, I don't believe there are no ghosts, but I don't take the position I can prove there are no ghosts. A, a slight difference, because as soon as you assert that something doesn't exist, you've just taken on the burden to prove it, and it's very difficult to prove a negative, particularly with those leprechauns. Don't you know that we creatures have the power of invisibility, don't you know? <laughs> okay, well, most people's talks, as you know, are thinly disguised commercials for the books they've written, and this talk will be no exception. My good friend Neil Tyson was Neil deGrasse Tyson was in my office recently and confessed to me that he had stolen that joke from me years ago, and he was he was on his way over to UB where he got a much bigger laugh with it than I ever do. So, so I'm glad that he that, that he took it. Uh, well, I've I've written uh, maybe more than 30 books. I don't know. It's probably 28 too many, uh, but. Um, I labor to use the scientific approach. I have a, a small laboratory at my work at, at CSI, and that's CSI 
not Crime Scene Investigation, CSI, but CSI Paranormal uh, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And uh, I wanted to start today with a forensic case that's one of my favorite cases. This started in 1903 when a young African-American man named Will West was brought into Leavenworth Penitentiary on a murder charge. At that time, fingerprinting was a novelty, was not implemented anywhere in the United States, and many people laughed at the idea that little squiggles on your fingers could uh, tell one person from the other. This was thought to be thigh-slappingly funny in many quarters. And at that time, they were using a system of identification called Bertillonage uh, that involved measuring the, the body in a detailed way. So the height, standing and sitting, the length of the outstretched arms, length and width of the skull, length of the right ear, um, pictures of the face, tabulation of scars, uh, uh, so forth, Bertillonage. And this is an example of that being implemented. And the records clerk, the Bertillon clerk, thought he recognized Will West. He said, you've been here before. And West said, no, sir, I have not. Uh, so he took his measurements, and he ran them through the file. And out came the pictures you see at the bottom. And whereupon, Will West said, uh, oh, the card said, uh, William West. And Will West is supposed to have said, well, yes, that looks like me, but, but that's not me. And then they realized that William West was over in one of the prison factories, and they brought them together. And as contemporary reports say, they were like two peas in a pod. They could not be told apart. And yet they were, as far as could be determined, they were unrelated. And it's been considered the most remarkable case of similar appearance of two individuals in human history and other great uh, uh, grandiose overstatements. And the fingerprint guys were just waiting for such an opportunity because they could tell these guys apart instantly and, and to a certainty every time. Well, interestingly, they had very similar Bertillon measurements. Look at this. Uh, these, these measurements, while not precisely the same, are so remarkably similar uh, that even just measurement error, if you measure me and I measure, uh, someone else measures me, we'll get different measurements slightly, just how tight you push the calipers and so forth. So this is really rather remarkable now. We have two men who look very much alike and they have similar measurements and they have similar names. Does anybody can anybody guess the theory I had? I grew up on this case as a young man and I, I believed it and then one day I had become a skeptic and I came back across this case and I said, I don't think so. What might explain this other than being one of the most astonishing sets of coincidences in human history? Yes, sir, over there. Separated at birth, Separated at birth what? Yes, twins. So this was my hypothesis. They might, be, they might be twins. Well, if this case happened today, we would use DNA. Now, there have been remarkable cases of uh, similar appearance. Uh, this, the guy on the upper left, is uh, Adolf Beck, or as I call him, poor, poor Adolf Beck, because Beck served out a prison term and almost served out a second prison term for the crimes of the swindler William Thomas, who's pictured on the right. Well, those men don't really look alike when you compare them side by side, but that's not how eyewitnesses do, is it? They see someone and they think of a certain type, burly man, big mustache, and if they see such a man a little later brought into custody and put with a lot of different types, uh, they may misidentify. But you can see that the thumbprints of these men are not similar, and there would be no trouble identifying them conclusively once you have them on file. The Wests are another matter. 
Here are the right thumbprints of Bill and Will West. They are remarkably similar. They are different fingerprints. Fingerprint experts have no trouble telling one the other, but they are both double loop whorls. This particular type of print with two deltas, two cores, and an interlocking loop. And you can see that those are, I think even just lay people here, you can see, can't you, that those are pretty similar fingerprint types without me going into great detail. The odds, I think, are mounting that we have some kind of genetic uh, basis here. So I began to use this kind of evidence to work on the Will, case, the Will West case. I was able, with the help of the FBI, to get copies of some of the records. I sent their um, facial features to an expert in um, uh, facial features who developed a dental kit where you put together eyes, nose, mouths, and so forth. And he said basically the face of one is the face of the other. I had their ear patterns, their ear um, configurations uh, compared by Alfred Dinarelli, the world's foremost expert in ear identification. Uh, nature doesn't make two fingerprints alike. It doesn't make two ears quite alike. Uh, he said that the West had more similar ears than even fraternal twins, in his opinion. And that he would be prepared to say, unless there was some grandiose contradiction, he would just think that they were twins. I sent their fingerprints to um, Toronto School of Medicine Division of Twin Registry where two experts looked at their fingerprint patterns because there are known genetic traits in fingerprint patterns, and they concluded first one and then the other um, did a separate study so they could uh, compare that the results were astronomical in favor of the hypothesis that they were, quote, monozygotic twins, one egg twins, identical twins. Well, I found more. I found uh, abstracts from the FBI files from Leavenworth. Originals had been destroyed, but there were abstracts kept of some of the records. While in prison, a fellow prisoner had deposed that he personally knew Bill West and also Will West at their home in the territory, uh, the Oklahoma Territory, and of his own knowledge knew them to be, quote, twin brothers. Oh, it's interesting. And then I found their correspondence records. And while they were at Leavenworth, both men wrote to the same brother, the same five sisters, and the same Uncle George. So um, I, I uh, suggest that the Wests were not a remarkable case of two unrelated lookalikes, but were a pretty ordinary case of uh, two twins who weren't apparently separated at birth and uh, didn't know each other, but in fact knew each other quite well. So why the deception? I have no idea. I wish I could go back in a time machine and solve this. I have an aunt who, um, uh, let my late aunt, who, who maybe read one too many Perry Mason stories, and she had a theory about it. She thought that maybe they didn't want people to know there were two of them and one could commit crimes and the other could set up an alibi. I don't know, I leave it to you critical thinkers. But I, I hope you'll uh, agree with me that, uh, that the most likely explanation is that they, are, that they were twins. I presented this at the, uh, uh, Association of the, the International Association of Identification, and I thought that people there were going to take me apart, but they did not. They just conceded, like, okay, well, you proved that and uh, my work has been published in the Journal of Police Science and other, uh, other forensic places. Well, <clears throat> let's turn to uh, something more horrible. In uh, 1974, Ronald Butch DeFeo murdered his parents and siblings in this horror house. And a year later, a little more than a year later, 1975, George and Kathy Lutz moved into the horror house 
and began to claim that there were all sorts of demonic and ghostly uh, occurrences. Uh, this became uh, the most um, sensational ghost story probably in our history. This is America's, I think, most famous haunted house. But I was struck by the fact that this, the, the goings on at, um, at 112 Ocean Avenue weren't like the haunted houses I had been investigating for years, where they tend to fall into some pretty standard kinds of formulas. People hear a noise, or they wake up and they think they see a ghostly figure, or there's poltergeist activity, things are being broken, and there's usually a kid who's suspected of, of acting up. But this case had everything. This had uh, demons and uh, poltergeists and, and uh, traditional ghosts and a little of everything all mixed together. And as soon as I heard some of this, I thought, this is suspicious. This, isn't, this sounds like a made-up story, not a, not a ghost story like I, I investigate. There were supposedly devil's footsteps found in the snow outside this horror house. Doors and windows ripped by demonic forces ripped off their hinges and damaged. Police called to this house to counsel the frightened family, the Lutz family. But let me tell you what investigation shows. The police were not called to that house. I got to know, uh, this, I, I do have a, one picture here to show you. Would you want to buy a used haunted house from this couple? Well, you could, I, I, but it turns out that I knew Barbara Cromarty who lived in the house after the Lutzes. And let me just tell you that, that there were no damaged doors or windows. The, the original hardware was still on those the original old varnish was in place. No locksmiths or anybody had ever been called to the house. This never happened. Those devil tracks in the snow, on the date given in the book, there, were no, there was no snow on the ground. So this story began to fall apart. I uh, helped, helped it fall apart. Um, this man, and I'm, I'm sorry, that's such a bad picture. I need a, need a better. Some of these are made from my old slides. But this man is William Weber. He was Ronald DeFeo's attorney. And he has testified that George and Kathy Lutz and he made up this horror story over several bottles of wine in his law office. And the grounds were that if they could convince people that there were demonic forces there that drove Ronald DeFeo to murder, maybe he could get a new trial. Go figure. Uh, that case is a matter now of court records, and uh, there were lawsuits over it because the crop, poor properties couldn't have a moment's peace in the house. Hey, people would show up on their lawn, call them on the phone, knock on the door, want to see the ghosts, and uh, they were uh, unable to stay in the house for quite different reasons. Uh, here's a, a more uh, typical haunted house at Liberty Hall. Uh, this house appears, from my investigation, not to be haunted at all. But at one time, a curator thought ghosts were good for business. She actually, <laughs> in her old age, confessed to me that she thought ghosts were good for business. That's hard to pay the, pay the, the bills for a haunted house, she said. And they circulated this ghost photo, this ghost on the stairs. Well, I think it's a fake photo. I, I probably know who made it. Um, we made this one. And it doesn't look exactly like the other one, but I think the other one has been copied and recopied. It gives it a little different appearance. But you can see how easily you can make a ghost photo by just simply opening, locking open the shutter and having someone dart up the stairs. And uh, so, the, a, a later curator decided it wasn't good to, uh, to hype the ghost, and uh, so tour guides quit telling people about the ghost, and the ghost appeared to, to go away. <laughs> Amazing. Well, as you know, as you know, uh, UFOs piloted by aliens are invading the planet Earth. 
I don't want any of you to panic and run for the exits as I present this, this data, but, um, oh no, wait a minute, that, that's right, I, I, I found otherwise, didn't I? Okay. Well, the UFO invasion, another, another uh, book from our sponsors. Uh, I like to work cold cases, and this, one, this case actually occurred in 1952, and I got to it decades later. It was never very adequately solved. But there was a case, September 12, 1952, something happened at Flatwoods. People saw a bright light dart across the sky, and these boys, and this woman, and a dog, had an encounter. Could all of those people and the dog be mistaken? I leave you with that, that question. But what, what happened is that they saw this bright light, they, they left the ball field, went up, they thought they saw something land up on the hilltop. They ran up there, got Mrs. May, her boy's flashlight dog, off they went, going up, it's dark now, and they shine a light and they see these shining eyes and all of a sudden this monster, this monster swooped at them making a high-pitched hissing sound and Mrs. May would forever talk about those terrible claws. And here she is. Here she is with an artist's conception of the Flatwoods monster. Now, I went to Flatwoods. There's another artist's conception of the Flatwoods monster, with the terrible claws, the shining eyes. Here's yet another. You get the idea. But this man, Johnny, Johnny Lockard, a wonderful old man in his 90s, I hope he's still alive, um, he told me there was nothing to this. He said that bright light was a meteor and everybody that knew anything knew that that meteor was seen over about three states. He didn't think it was a flying saucer and he just thought people were being silly. Well, Mr. Lockard's son, himself no young kid, Max, Max and I are great friends. Whenever I'm down that way, I can always stop in for a, a sandwich and and a beer or whatever. And uh, Max told me how that night he went up after the boys had come running down and were scared to death and he, uh, he got in his black pickup truck and he drove up there and he drove all around the field. He didn't see anything, he came back, but he said, I'll tell you this, he said they were genuinely scared. This was not a hoax or something. They were scared to death. One of them was, was throwing up which is a, true, a sign of true hysteria. And Max told me that <clears throat> the next day they found uh, skid marks and some kind of black gunk at the site, which people were sure was from the flying saucer. He said, no, it came from my pickup truck. Uh, it was from the oil pan and those were my skid marks. I tried to tell them, he said, but nobody would listen. Well, today uh, this book is out, uh, exaggerating it even further. But here's what I think happened. This is a split image drawing. On the, on the left, you see um, a version of the monster as you've seen some pictures of it now. And on the right is what I think caused all the fuss. Uh, it has the shining eyes, it has the terrible claws, it, it makes the swooping sound, it, it makes the high-pitched hissing noise. And it is the, the barn owl. And I believe that's what the Flatwoods monster really, really was. A terrifying creature. But what about Mothman? A similar case from 1966 and 67. And my first reaction to, to Mothman when I began to look into it was it was our friend the barn owl again. In fact, the cover on Lauren Coleman's book uh, could very well be uh, something like that. But uh, I went down there and as I studied it more thoroughly, um, again, uh, some type of owl, but I now believe, I now believe that Mothman was not a, not a barn owl after all. I believe it was, listen closely, a barred owl. <laughs> the area where Mothman was seen was the McClinic Wildlife Preserve 
which was filled with barred owls. And the clue finally that changed my thinking was they kept talking about these eyes which, which shone like bicycle reflectors, this crimson red, just vivid, vivid, vivid red. And that's not probably the barn owl, but that's the barred owl for sure. And when I did this for Monster Quest, the popular television show, uh, they, um, they got a barred owl and uh, it actually looks surprisingly uh, similar to the descriptions. All right, but we're still on aliens. What about, what about those alien abductions? Well, John Mack studied 13 cases of alien abduction and he believed that it was just hard to explain what people were reporting other than the uh, alien hypothesis. But in fact, when you looked at each of these, I found that people were having waking dreams. They were being hypnotized, of course. Let me define hypnosis for you. It's, quote, the yellow brick road to fantasy land. And so people were, uh, the, the, the best cases that he had were people who had the traits for what's called fantasy proneness. It's an unusual person, but a sane and normal person, maybe 4% of the public. I don't think there would be as many in this audience as might be in, say, a new age audience. Um, but they have very rich uh, imaginations, may have had, for example, imaginary playmate as a child. Some of us do and grow out of it. Uh, they believe they have special powers. They are easily hypnotized and so on. Um, Whitley Strieber, if you know his work, Whitley Strieber is a classic fantasy-prone personality. I say that citing psychologists who have looked over his traits. And some of the imaginative skills that he uses in his science fiction writing have caused him to think that he was an alien abductee. But again, he's had waking dreams and other um, things that are more easily explained. I just got back from the New York State Academy of Fire Science where I spent three days as an instructor and they wanted me to talk about, you, I know you're asking out there, uh, what the hell does he know about fire science and, 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 and you're right to be skeptical. But, <laughs> but when I tell you the topic, You'll say, as one of my friends did, who sort of challenged me, like, you teaching at the, yeah, right. And I said, well, maybe I should just tell you the topic. He said, what's that? I said, spontaneous human combustion. <laughs> oh, yeah, he said, I'll oh, shut up. I'll touch it. Yeah. yeah, okay. So let me, let me give you a case. 1951, Mary Hardy Reeser at St. Petersburg, uh, Florida, and her landlady, um, was trying to deliver a telegram uh, when the door knob was too hot to handle. Uh, she ran and ran for help and some uh, workmen came and broke in and uh, as, as we now know, the, this scene was one in which uh, Mrs. Reeser's body was uh, pretty much gone, um, destroyed as thoroughly as a crematorium might do, um, bones calcined, reduced to powder, and yet nearby objects were not damaged and the um, uh, apartment was in pretty good shape except for some uh, soot staining and heat damage at the top. So how do we explain something like this? Well, even some fire and arson investigators are, you know, who are a little superstitious are willing to say, yeah, it must be spontaneous human combustion because we have many cases in which people we have no apparent or obvious source of the ignition, we're told, and this severe destruction which does not uh, destroy the entire place. Now this is what's left of Mrs. Reeser after it's sorted out. But let me tell you some facts that I found on this, if you'll pardon the, uh, the expression, this cold case. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Reeser was last seen wearing flammable night clothes. She was sitting in a big stuffed chair. She was smoking a cigarette. She had taken two second all sleeping tablets. She told her son, who was a physician, that she planned to take two more second all sleeping tablets because she was having real trouble sleeping. Does anybody here think we have a problem explaining how Mrs. Reeser might catch on fire without having recourse to the word spontaneous? 
Okay, now the rest of the mystery. Uh, the apartment didn't burn because the floor and walls were concrete. But still, a point is made. The body was burned very, very, very thoroughly. And for that, uh, we invoked, my forensic friend John Fisher and I invoked, something called the Wick Effect. And we, we got laughed at by proponents. But the Wick Effect is that um, your body, your body fat is very flammable and your clothing can act to absorb that much like a wick does and make that burning very, very efficient. And small experiments with a little human fat rolled in cloth had shown that that was a viable hypothesis, but it remained for John DeHaan, a fire expert who had cited my work in one of his textbooks, to actually put it to the test with a carcass of a pig and uh, the wick effect absolutely is a reality. And um, I've now spoken on that subject for National Geographic's Is It Real? Um, a uh, major hour-long documentary for Discovery Channel. And I lectured on it at the Fire Academy. I've lived long enough to see that that's been pretty well now established as an explanation. So I've watched something in the paranormal. Mystery, yes. You could debunk it easily and say, well, you know, there's no way the body can spontaneously combust. But I'm in the business of saying, yes, but what, how do we explain the mystery? That, that's what's important. Then the debunking will take care of itself, you see. Otherwise, if you say, well, I don't know what happened, but it wasn't paranormal, I, I, I just think you're not uh, getting very far with that. Okay, let's turn to miraculous healings. I'm going to move along a little faster here. Uh, this is the Grotto at Lourdes, where in 1858, Bernadette Subaru, now St. Bernadette, at the age of 14, claimed to see uh, the Virgin Mary and be in contact with the Virgin Mary and pointed out where she could find this spring in this grotto and that it would heal people. But the healing powers of Lourdes were not for Bernadette, who died young, and uh, it could not heal her. Um, but what's happening at places like Lourdes, or here's a healing shrine. Recognize this DJ at Lilydale. Um, and know this guy? Uh, how many of you watched Oprah the other day when this guy was on? Oh, this is not a big Oprah crowd. Okay. <laughs> I'm shocked, Randy. <laughs> I'm shocked. But this guy is John of God from Brazil, and this, this is me in one of, my, uh, one of my makeovers. I went there undercover for National Geographic, and uh, John of God has these, uh, these entities who, who um, uh, tell him, you know, what's wrong with you and all this stuff. They, they didn't tell him that I was a phony there to expose him. How good are they? Not so good, I think. He does things like stick forceps way back in your head. And people think this is, I mean, it has no cure. Could you imagine that this would have any curative value for anything? But it's very dramatic. It looks like he's just supernaturally stuck something back in your, this far in your head. It's just incredible. Unless you know about the, the cavity there. And so when National Geographic was talking about this, I said, We'll just bring in my friend. I've done some work with Carnival Sideshows. I brought in a human blockhead who drives screwdrivers in there, and Randy's nodding, you know that. that. So he took, he took a, a hand drill and cranked it in his head for, for National Geographic. We had great fun with it. And um, we think John of God is a, is a phony. Well, um, but this guy's a phony too, but he's a good phony. Uh, here's Nancy Fowler, who's, who uh, had uh, many uh, encounters with the Virgin Mary at Conyers, Georgia. I believe Nancy is probably a fantasy-prone personality, like many of the Marian apparitions people. They have very vivid imaginations. They can imagine that they see and talk to uh, invisible entities, uh, which is just sort of really, if you think about it, just a grown-up version of your imaginary playmate as a child, right? That's well, it turns out that it, um, I was asked by Atlanta Channel 5 to uh, come there and investigate. It turned out that at, uh, at Conyers, the, um, the site of the, the water, the blessed well water, was contaminated with E. coli. And the, <laughs> the, authorities, the authorities had to close it down until science 
pause here for dramatic effect, until science could get rid of the E. coli and then the miracle was back. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, yeah, I thought that was, that was good. <clears throat> now this guy, this guy, this is, <laughs> this is Peter Popoff and that's James Randi. <clears throat> and this guy put that guy out of business overnight. Because Randy, you know, this, this curious, curious fellow that I've known for 40 years or so, Randy was, you know, went to pop off and, and he wondered why, why he had a hearing aid, you know, physician heal thyself. And on a few other suspicions, Randy and friends went in, smuggled in a radio intercept device, and when you uh, could hear, he went on Johnny Carson's show and played, played Popoff doing this trick that he did. He would say, I'm getting a name there, and the person would stand up, and he'd know their street address and their ailment and all this stuff. It was very impressive. It's called a word of knowledge. Randy kept worrying about that, that hearing aid, so he went in. So he, on the Johnny Carson show, you see, you see Popoff do this trick, and the audience is pretty impressed, and then Randy played, of course, so you could hear what Popoff heard in his hearing aid, which went something like this from Mrs. Popoff. Hello, Petey, can you hear me? If you can't, we're both in trouble, Some, something like that. And the next, the next sucker's name, no, he didn't use the word sucker. She didn't use, or did she? Uh, the, the next person's name is so-and-so, and, and he's, he's got this, this problem and so forth. I tell Randy's stories better than, better than he does. And uh, so, and he tells my stories better than, than I do. But playing this on the Johnny Carson show put Popoff out of business uh, almost immediately. Uh, but he, he made a comeback, and here I, I went up to see him in uh, Toronto a few years ago, and, and uh, he healed my back pain. Yep, I didn't have one, but had there been one, he, it would have been very effective. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, this creature is not what you think. This is not Bigfoot. No, this creature's name is Big Suit. Big Suit. Um, but here is Bigfoot, or is this just another version of a Big Suit? Well, this is the case for Bigfoot. 1967 film by Roger Patterson, a Bigfoot repeater. And Patterson uh, had a habit of finding creatures like this, and this time he photographed it. Uh, I think it looks like a, um, a man in a furry suit, and I think that's where, that you're actually seeing the real guy's nose and eye there. It's just an opening like this. Um, I know the, the costumer who sold this to Roger Patterson, so he says, uh, Phil Morris, the magician and ghost, um, ghost guy. And Phil has assured me that he knows that he sold this to Roger Patterson. A man named Bob Hieronymus has come forward and said he was the guy in the suit. And they put all this together. And when Hieronymus is doing his imitation of the Patterson Bigfoot, it sure looks similar to me. The same kind of walk and so forth. So, but if not, that's the only authentic photo of the only authentic Bigfoot because almost all the other stuff just doesn't even get to first base evidence wise. Turning to lake monsters, this is the famous Loch Ness monster. How many of you, from 1934, how many of you know that this was a hoax? Okay, the word has gotten around. Now see, Oprah's crowd doesn't know this. <laughs> this, is, this was an April Fool's hoax. Uh, here we are at Lake Champlain where a uh, lakeside, there's a list of the famous sightings. But as one guy th told me in a bar where I was doing research, <laughs> that's right, no, 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 I know what you're thinking. I was actually doing research in a bar along Lake Champlain and I found this guy and his name is on that list. So he ought to know when he says, sir, that's a list of the local drinkers. Okay, but seriously, seriously, I go out and, on lakes, and not because I'm expecting to find a lake monster. Here I am at Lake, uh, 
Lake Utopia in, uh, in Canada. But people do see long-necked, multi-humped, undulating creatures in many of our lakes. I've gone with National Geographic to Lake Okanagan, British Columbia, been to Lake Champlain, um, Lake Memphremagog, and so forth. There are many of these lakes. It's just very unlikely that there's an ancient plesiosaur or anything like that in these lakes, which are not very old. They're about uh, 10,000 years old, left over from the last ice age. And if there were a creature, it would have, there would actually have to be several creatures, a breeding population for the creature to reproduce itself. So it's very, very, very unlikely that there is, on the one hand, such, such a monster. On the other hand, and let me say this in all seriousness, I have met, been in the homes, I know what I'm talking about. There are sane, sober, sincere eyewitnesses who have seen what I just described to you. And they don't deserve to be laughed at. If, if they want to make fun of themselves as a local drinker, okay. But, but really, they have seen something that looks very much like this. I have begun to research this. I have met some people who have seen the monster and then saw what it really was. Now let me pause here and say, I'm not saying that this one explanation fits all lake monsters everywhere. Is that clear that I've said that? Just as I would not say that all UFO reports are weather balloons. That would be a foolish thing to say. I'm saying that of the best reports of a long-necked, multi-humped, undulating creature on the surface of the water, and I did this for uh, Monster Quest, we went to Lake Crescent where it was supposed to be a giant eel, and I showed that eels swim like this. They don't swim like this. They are, they are not uh, daytime creatures, they're nocturnal, and they're not seen on the surface, swimming on the surface of the water, they're bottom feeders. So I said, this is not a giant eel, but there is something that looks like this. And that creature is the Northern River Otter, if you have two or three of them swimming in a line. And if they're swimming more or less along the illusion is incredible, and it's actually, now there's some photographs of this illusion. It's astonishing how much it looks like the classic lake monster pictures. Well, of course, you couldn't fake a giant creature like this. What a horrible, gigantic creature. And the, the frog on the left is pretty awesome, too. <laughs> Okay, you knew where I was going with that, right? So, this is the Coleman frog, the much touted world's largest frog and so forth, at uh, Killarney Lake, supposedly from Killarney Lake near Fredericton, New Brunswick. And um, I have the scoop on that. Now, you may think that, um, that I did DNA tests, and I didn't get that kind of access, but I sweet-talked my way into the museum's uh, records, and I found in there uh, where they had done a conservation report, and words like wire and plaster and paint uh, leapt off the page at me. And uh, further research has convinced me that this is most likely was what there's some evidence for. This was simply a store display for a cure-all called frog in throat cough syrup <laughs> or cough remedy. But uh, it's locally uh, the subject of much um, ballyhoo. And people there pretend that they believe this story. They don't really, the locals don't much believe it. So I had a fun debate with one of the guys and he pretend, pretended to take it very seriously and to be very offended with me. And I played along accordingly. We had a fun debate. So there I, there I am uh, challenging the beloved local frog. Well, uh, finally, I think I'll talk about, uh, just very quickly, about spiritualism. Uh, you know that in 1848, the Fox sisters, also known as the Foxy sisters, uh, were uh, the originators of modern spiritualism. They uh, claimed to um, be in contact with the ghost of a murdered peddler, and there were mysterious rapping sounds that would answer uh, questions. And 
overnight, spiritualism uh, flourished in the Rochester area and then cross-swept the United States, went to Europe, in, in Australia. And 40 years later, when they confessed that it was all a trick, uh, they couldn't get the genie back in the bottle. And it's still, spiritualism is waxes and wanes, but it's still there. Uh, this is the historic cottage where this took place. And here I am at Lilydale. The cottage was moved there and later burned. DJ and I have spent uh, quality time at Lilydale. It's a beautiful and scenic place. Uh, the cottage is, it looks like an artist's colony, except of course um, the signs don't say so-and-so artist. They say so-and-so medium. Uh, but otherwise, you know, it's a lovely place. I have uh, some friends there and, uh, of course, more enemies there um, by their choice. Uh, there I am at the library. Uh, the museum has been just wonderful to me. Joyce LeJudas, who's dead now, is very nice to me. I had complete access to anything, anytime I ever wanted. There's Joyce. She died. And, uh, but the new curator said uh, he was going to honor because he, he knew she would want it. I could still have access and uh, they have things like there's the spiritualism sign from the Fox Cottage, uh, various spirit slates and writings. Um, I examined this spirit slate from Abraham, written by Abraham Lincoln um, carefully. I, again, complete access. Even some of the mediums would not have the access that I had. But I could take things out of the display case and handle it. The Davenport Boys scrapbook. Um, anything and I studied this at some length and um, I'm convinced on uh, various grounds that this is not the spirit of Abraham Lincoln writing um, I know you probably you probably were already skeptical but it never hurts to uh, to show why we are skeptical first thing is this is not even an imitation of Abraham Lincoln's handwriting looks nothing like it but of course you never know about over in the spirit world it might be a little hard to write with chalk um, but the thing that, uh, one of the things that convinced me was uh, right here where it says, can you read that, should of, for should have. Lincoln, master of the language? Nah, not going to believe that one. And of course other fakes including spirit paintings. This one materialized in a short period of time in a seance at Lilydale. I'm suspicious. One of the tricks, this obviously couldn't have been painted during the time of the seance, but what I think happened is this was already painted and it was covered with a piece of blank canvas with a little uh, uh, magician's wax or something in the corners. And in fact, I examined the, the painting and you can see damage in each of the four corners of the painting. And I believe that's significant. Um, we've, we've been there. Uh, the uh, inspiration stump where the mediums get up and do readings. And uh, this is Patricia Bartlett's place. She's dead now, so I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, I've, I've told this once, uh, maybe at JREP, but I, I think some of you have not heard it yet. I, I kept the story sort of quiet while she was alive. She was a sweet lady, but she, she would have you and she would do a drawing. You'd sit down and she'd do a drawing. Uh, kind of like a Coney Island sketch artist, but she's not looking at you doing a drawing of you. She's looking just over your shoulder. It's very disconcerting, you know, to have someone looking over your shoulder while they're drawing. And, and she drew pictures of your spirit guide. You know that you all have your own spirit guides, right? Yeah, in the other world. Yeah. And uh, there she is. She's just very sweet. And I, she had, I think she just had rich imagination. I, I don't know, but she seemed very nice. And so as she got ready and got her chalks out, I said, you know, ma'am, I, I think I may have seen my spirit guide once. And she said, oh, perking up. I said, yes, it was a troubled time in my life. I was having all these difficulties. And I went on for some time, as is my want. <laughs> and then I said, and I woke up one night, and there was this Native American figure standing by my bedside. And he had three yellow feathers sticking up. And he said to me, everything will be all right, my son. And I don't remember what happened after that. I must have gone back to sleep. Did I mention the three yellow feathers? And she said, well, yes, we, we're, we can give him a name. We, we're permitted to do that. We can call him Yellow Bird. 
I said, oh, for the, the um, three, three yellow feathers. Yes, she said, would you like me to see if I can contact Yellowbird? And I thought, this would be really good because I just made him up on the way here. <laughs> but I, I said, yes, it, it would mean a lot to me if you could contact Yellowbird. And so she began to draw. And uh, I'll close with this, uh, this image. Um, you can't fake evidence like this. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> I have time for questions. You do. I, I could make, I'll say, uh, two hours available. <laughs> okay, that's a little long. Yeah. Five minutes yeah. or something? Whatever. I'm, I'm happy. Okay, that's good. Yeah. You know, try to be nice. I'm not going to ask you to debunk my hat. I, I couldn't. I, or I just, if I could, I wouldn't try. And I won't suggest that you've ever failed to debunk something, uh, using that bad word. But what's your favorite case that hasn't been solved yet? I am working on some, some old and cold cases, but I prefer not to talk about them. I've, I've unfortunately, a couple of times, had someone think, well, that's a great idea, and went and, and uh, researched something they knew I was working on to beat me to the punch. I, I'm just astonished that anybody would do I find that unethical, but it's happened to me more than once. So I don't usually talk about what I'm, what I'm working on. But uh, probably the spontaneous human combustion was certainly one of the things that I mean, I knew right off it wasn't a spontaneous human combustion. But I, to explain that each of these cases is different and try to find what was the explanation, uh, John Fisher and I looked at 30 historical cases from the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. And uh, we found common themes, and, and you get the idea from, from my presentation. But that was one where I honestly was really very, very curious as to what was causing this phenomenon. All right, well, he took my question, so I had to think of another one real fast. Thank you. Not necessarily. <laughs> um, well, uh, I'm just paraphrasing a little bit. Basically, what is uh, a claim that you have not yet been able to look into that you're interested in looking into? Well, uh, again, there are specific cases that uh, come up all the time. Um, maybe I could say that I'm going to St. Louis and I'm going to be looking into the Pearl Curran case. Uh, please don't go there um, <laughs> ahead of me. Um, but uh, this is a case of channeled writings, and they have some of the papers there, and I'm hoping to examine them. Who knows what I'll find? I use, uh, I, I'll use anything as an investigative tactic. I've used blood pattern analysis uh, with an appropriate expert to debunk the, um, the um, Atlanta House of Blood mystery. And I've used linguistic analysis. I made it sort of a joke out of the Lincoln, but I actually would look at uh, linguistic evidence as one kind of evidence. Any kind, you know, let's be innovative and look at different kinds of evidence. So, so that is a case, the channeling of um, the entity uh, known as Patience Worth. You know that case very well, very famous old case. I'm just seeing if there's anything new I can come up with. Yes, sir? I was just going to say, I didn't come up today. I know there's probably stuff out there, but uh, what would you say is the explanation for proving that Ouija boards don't work? That what? About Ouija boards. How would you say oh, that Ouija those boards. Don't Ouija boards. That one is so easy to answer. I'm going to let Randy come up here and. No. Okay. All right. Okay. But but Randy's uh, encyclopedia of fakes and frauds. He he refers to it as the idiomotor force. Right. That's not idiot motor. It's idiomotor force. But unconscious muscular activity. Uh, the same thing that if if you uh, hold a pendulum and you start thinking that it's going to go this way, it it will. And you can have just wonderful um, results. Um, table tipping, I have uh, undercover and in disguise sat at table tipping seances 
where the table would tip for yes and no. Um, there, I think, probably maybe more deliberate activity. Some Ouija board stuff is unconscious. Some of it's people playing pranks. Dowsing is another example of this, you know, the, the dowsing rods. And when, if you know where uh, the, the, the thing is, it will, it will go off. You know, the, the ones will cross and so forth. But that's basically explanation. I had a guy, Randy will appreciate this. This is, a, um, I, I steal his material whenever I can. Um, but there was a guy who wrote me and he said, uh, he said he was in touch with ancient Greek entities by Ouija board. And he demanded that I test him. Well, it, I was young in my career. Now I just refer people to Randy to be tested. But at the time I thought, well, okay, you know, I said, well, here's what we're going to do. You, you have to pay all your expenses to come here. And we're going to use a Ouija board of my manufacturer in which the alphabet is scrambled. And you, your vision will be shielded from the view of that, whereupon I predict that you will spell out only gibberish. I said, you might want to try this at home before you go to the trouble to come here. I never heard from him again. <laughs> but, but. Yep. Um, at the beginning of your talk, you said something along the lines of somebody who makes the claim that, that something doesn't exist takes upon them the burden, the burden of proof. And correct me if I'm wrong if you didn't say that. No, I, I do say that. Uh, in fact, when somebody says, well, I can't prove aliens exist, but you can't prove they don't, that person just lost the argument. Because in a court of law, in science, in scholarship, the burden of proof is on the claimant, not on someone to prove a negative. You can't prove that there you know, isn't a hollow moon with aliens hiding in camps in the hollow of the moon, but we shouldn't have any reason to believe that that's so. That was actually my question, was that if you think that that's true in the case of an atheist. So if <laughs> someone has no evidence but is asserting something, they have, they have the burden to prove something. So if someone asserts there's God, you know, I would say, well, what's your evidence? And then if the evidence is no good, well, then it's not proved. But for me to try to disprove it, you know, it's like the idea of proving that leprechauns don't exist. We can go to Ireland, but then we'll be told, ah, oh, but you, you, you didn't go to Blarney Castle. So we have to put back our pith helmets back on, get the nets, go back. And this time we're told, ah, oh, but don't you know the wee creatures have the power of invisibility, don't you know? Now, if anybody here is prepared to finance such an expedition to, uh, to Ireland, which will require a certain amount of drinking at various pubs, I can make myself available. But I don't have to prove there aren't any leprechauns. I believe there are not, but I would never assert there are no leprechauns because then I have to prove they're not and it, I can't do it, you see. So I just think we just fall back on the rules of evidence that the burden of proof is on the claimant or the advocate of an idea just as it is in a court of law. You could not, for example, prove you're not a serial killer. So fortunately you don't have to. And, and, <laughs> Personally, I don't think you are. This will be the last question. A so, last question. No pressure on this guy. Oh. Oh, just getting warmed up. I'll talk a, to you all later. Yes, sir. I just had a quick question about, uh, you know, the work that you do tends to conflict with pe some people's beliefs, you know, especially if they have some sort of cultural uh, propensity for those types of beliefs. How do you deal with those types of arguments against which, which you do? They can get very angry. Um, Shroud of <laughs> Turin people um, particularly. Uh, I just try to reason with people and I say, look, you know, you shouldn't start with the answer and then work backwards to the evidence. And I, and I did this at some length at a, at a Shroud conference once and they were just waiting for the question and answer period because they were, you know, it's like if, if you were all Shroudies and there was me, see it's a different audience, right? A little different, you're a little more vulnerable in that. So they were just waiting and they said, you say that we start with the answer and work back, you do the same thing. And I said, I, let me labor to show you that I, that I do not. I said, I didn't write the gospels, did I? But the gospel of John says multiple cloths, a separate cloth over the face, tying and binding. This is not the Shroud of Turin, doesn't look good to me. Is it my fault there's no history for 1,350 years? And so I just went back over my evidence, mentioning the forger's confession, the tempera paint, and so forth, and saying, look, I had nothing to do with any of this. I'm just saying that 
it looks awfully, awfully bad for the Shroud of Turin. And, but it, when you can, you know, you, you try to reason with people, but oftentimes they are thinking with their emotions and you are thinking here and you're just ships passing in the night. I had a woman once wanted to come up and talk to me after a talk. She had some photos. She showed them to me. I look at them and I'm saying, oh, you got your camera strap in front of it. Here's some orbs. And she grabs them back from me and says, you don't understand. My father had just died and we were getting all sorts of messages. Not just these pictures. We're getting all kinds of messages and signs from him. Now, I saw this was not going well. And I felt bad because I think I should have done better in setting this up. So um, what I think I might could have done was said, well, tell me something about what context these pictures were made in. And then I could have said, well, you know, I understand how you must feel. I remember when my grandmother died. And I could have tried to get on a level that...